Hello, hello, my name is Mina, and welcome back to my channel. Welcome if you've never been here, but today we're going to be talking about celebrity relationships. I feel like there's always like so many different celebrity relationships that people are talking about all at once, but I feel like the biggest news in my circle, in my algorithm, which granted may have been affected by the fact that I did go to Taylor Swift era's tour. Yes, I did. Uh, <laughs> my friend's dad works for this company that had a box at um, the MetLife Stadium, so I was able to get a free ticket, which was really nice, and I had a blast. I love concerts. I feel like I don't really go to concerts very often because I'm just not very savvy with like Ticketmaster, and I also feel like I don't love any particular artist enough to spend like hundreds of dollars on a ticket to see them. So I'm really happy that I got this opportunity though because I do really like Taylor Swift. I was just like looking at those ticket prices and I was like, oh, that's not going to happen. So I'm really thankful to my friend Francesca. Shout out to you for offering me a free ticket. But why did I bring this up? Oh yeah, because Taylor Swift was on my radar, naturally her relationship with Matt Healy was also on my radar, unfortunately, actually, because... Okay, sorry, guys. I keep calling him Matt, even though I know in my heart that it's Maddie. It's just like, this is new information for me because for years, I always thought his name was Matt. And then it was only recently that it was clarified to me that it's Maddie. And I'm still trying to get that, um, you know, sound moving in my mouth. Ew. If you don't know who Matt Healy is, he is the front man of the 1975. Matt Healy is a very controversial figure. I feel like everything I know about Matt Healy has been fed to me against my will. I'm really not a fan at all. And he's done a lot of like crazy things. But most recently, he was on the Adam Friedman, Friedland, Adam Friedland show, during which him and the host were making fun of Ice Spice, who is this new rapper. They not only made fun of her, they were making disparaging remarks about her body and her ethnicity. And then later in the episode, Matt Healy asked the host for their impressions of Japanese people working in concentration camps. He's also just like done weird stuff, like he's eaten raw meat on stage, which is not problematic, it's just weird. He also has a tendency to kiss fans or people who are in the audience, which I feel like is a weird thing to do considering the power dynamic between a celebrity and their fans. Let's kiss, for real, right now. No. Needless to say, a lot of people were not thrilled by the fact that he and Taylor started dating. And there was actually this one hashtag that was being circulated called hashtag speak out now. <laughs> which was accompanied by a graphic imploring Taylor to reflect on the impact of her and her associates' behavior. So yeah, a lot of the Swifties were desperate. They were like, if she at least like decides to keep dating him, please like at least disavow what he's been saying, but she never did. So as of this past week, but by the time this video comes out, it'll be in a couple weeks. So I'll just say as of recently, Matt Healy and Taylor Swift did break up, according to page six, you know super, super uh, legitimate source. I bring this up because I feel like whenever Taylor Swift is involved in something, she obviously gets a lot of media attention. But just in general, people really care about who their favorite celebrities are dating. Even on like a less like crazy note, um, Timothy Chalamet and Kylie Jenner are allegedly dating. And I've seen so many memes about that, so many jokes about how weird it is. So yeah, even if like the people themselves aren't necessarily controversial. People still care to a degree where it becomes an online conversation. And I just wanted to look into why we care. <laughs> we'll also get into like the history of certain couples. We'll do some case studies. Um, it should be, this should be fun. Is it me? Am I the drama? I don't think I'm the drama. Maybe I am. Of course we don't care about every single couple that exists, right? There's like thousands, millions of them. But we do care whenever a couple makes a headline because of some spicy drama going on in their lives. <laughs> because when that happens, their relationship becomes a form of entertainment. In 2016, a group of scientists actually found that watching dramatic movies triggers endorphins and brings in an increased sense of group bonding. So watching celebrity drama probably creates some of the same effects. Fixating on other people's problems can also act as a form of escapism for people from their own stressful lives. 
So there are some couples that are involved in multiple dramatic scandals over a long period of time throughout their relationship. For example, F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald, or more recently, Tristan Thompson and Khloe Kardashian. But one of the biggest celebrity relationship scandals of the 20th century involved movie star Elizabeth Taylor, who actually had seven marriages throughout her life. One of her husbands, Richard Burton, a Welsh actor, she married in 1964, divorced in 1974, remarried in 1975, then divorced again in 1976. Elizabeth and Richard first started rendezvousing as an extramarital affair. Elizabeth was on her fourth marriage with singer-actor Eddie Fisher, and Richard had been married to actress Sybil Williams for the previous 14 years and counting. Given the circumstances of how they met, plus the on-off divorcing and remarrying, it's no surprise their relationship caused a media circus. The press even dubbed them Liz and Dick. According to gossip columnist Luella Parsons, the massive amount of publicity they received ought to have killed them. So the pair met in 1962 on the set of filming Cleopatra, which was produced by 20th Century Fox. Remember, this was the 60s, so extramarital affairs were even spicier than they are today. As a response to the scandal, 20th Century Fox sued Elizabeth and Richard for $50 million, and the U.S. State Department considered even revoking Richard's work visa after an Ohio representative called their relationship a public outrage. The couple was also known for spending lavishly, which added this, like, cinematic flair to their relationship. According to a Vanity Fair article, Burton once bought a $960,000 jet plane on a whim after they flew on it to Paris. The couple supported an army of charities, extended family, and staff. They brought property in Puerto Vallarta, Switzerland, and Ireland, and owned the Calisma, their floating luxe palace. They also owned paintings by Monet, Picasso, Renoir, Ruelt, Pissarro, Degas, Augustus John, and Rembrandt. But their most lavish spending was on jewelry. Taylor had an insatiable love and desire for jewels. And like you would expect for any whirlwind romance, uh, Elizabeth and Richard were also known for their fights, both in the private and public sphere. And some of the comments that they've made to the press raise eyebrows on whether or not these fights were genuine or if some of them were more performative. For example, Elizabeth once said, Richard loses his temper with true enjoyment. It's beautiful to watch. And Richard spoke on the subject too, telling the Daily Mirror, We live out for the benefit of the mob, the sort of idiocies they've come to expect. We will often pitch a battle purely for the exercise. I will accuse her of being ugly. She will accuse me of being a talentless son of a bitch. And this sort of frightens people. I love arguing with Elizabeth. Sounds healthy. <laughs> However, despite the strain the press undoubtedly put on their relationship and coverage that usually painted Elizabeth in a misogynistic light, tabloid and media coverage of their incredible wealth, European socialite status, and performative drama all contributed to public interest in them overall, which ultimately added to their career success. For example, in 1964, the New York Times covered Richard's run as Hamlet on Broadway. The couple drew unprecedented crowds of 5,000 plus people that required a dozen policemen to barricade a path for their exit. The New York Times reported at the time, it becomes evident after questioning theater veterans and people in the crowds that neither Mr. Burton alone nor Miss Taylor by herself attracts the thousands. Rather, it appears that the combination of both has created a kind of third personality that has excited the imagination of the public. When questioned, members of the crowd usually reply that they want to see Mr. Burton and Miss Taylor because of all the publicity about their romance. Even in the 80s, the hype for their relationship continued. By 1983, Richard and Elizabeth had moved on to other partners, but they collaborated again professionally on a stage revival of Noelle Coward's play, Private Lives. The premise of the play centers around fighting honeymooners, and of course, the two actors were starring as the leads. Initially, when Private Lives debuted in Boston, a lot of critics were left unimpressed and wrote unfavorable reviews. However, the appeal of these two leads basically mirroring their relationship for the stage, brought in so many sales. W.J. Weatherby, who reviewed the play for The Guardian when it reached Broadway, called it the show business event of the season, as tabloids filled their columns with gossip and will-they-won't-they they rumors of a third marriage surfaced. Couples that are also tied together with a love triangle also tend to bring in a lot of media coverage, specifically misogynistic media coverage, Society loves to see two women in particular in competition over a man. They love to frame the tension, the tension, I use air quotes because sometimes it's completely fabricated, but quotes the tension between the two women as a signal of a cat fight. And they love using slut shaming tactics to criticize the quote unquote other woman in the relationship with of course little attention on the man, even if he's cheating. 
For kids in the 2000s, our big celebrity love triangle was Aaron Carter, Hilary Duff, and Lindsay Lohan. And recently, Selena Gomez and Hailey Bieber's apparent feud over Justin Bieber made headlines. But I actually think the most interesting coverage of our time was on the triangle of Brad Pitt, Jennifer Aniston, and Angelina Jolie. As a preface, um, Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston started dating in 1998 and tied the knot in 2000. In January 2005, they announced they were separating, and two months later, Jennifer filed for divorce. During the divorce proceedings, Brad was filming Mr. and Mrs. Smith with Angelina Jolie. They immediately started dating, though claimed there was never any infidelity. And in June 2005, Brad Pitt did an interview with Diane Sawyer, who interviewed him, or more like grilled him, about his relationship with Angelina. Did Angelina Jolie break up your marriage? No. Everyone says she's a homewrecker. It's a good story. Ultimately, this love triangle had the right optics for a Hollywood picture. Angelina Jolie's image in the 90s was, as Vanity Fair put it, that of a tattooed vixen with a taste for bisexuality, heroin, brotherly incest, mental institutions, and wearing her husband's blood. In contrast, Jennifer Aniston was the girl next door, America's sweetheart. As Guardian columnist Zoe Williams argued in 2022, Jennifer was an ideal woman for the post-feminist 90s, as exemplified by her hair. Not too long, attention-seeking, not too short, feminist slash independent, not too blonde, conventional, or too dark, vampy, not too shiny, airhead, nor in any way dull, frigid. It was the perfect man-pleasing hair for the late 20th century woman. And of course, a lot of the people who were Team Jennifer held on to these kinds of 90s characterizations of them. I think I was questioning whether all those, that, that part of me that, you know, with my tattoos and my, and my wild side and my darker side, whether that same person could also be one day a wife and a mother and, and a good friend. Angelina's pivot towards humanitarian work and motherhood in the early 2000s added another element to the story, ultimately swaying much of the public into her favor. As Constance Grady explains for Vox, Jennifer was painted as the loser, the spinster, poor pathetic Jen. Dark rumors swirl that maybe she hadn't even wanted children, that maybe she picked her career over kids. So what was Brad's role in all this? Grady notes, Brad Pitt didn't have to prove he was the right kind of man. That was already assumed. He existed to choose the right woman and to prove her rightness with his approval. The love triangle framing gave the audiences an opportunity to pick sides, which allowed fans to bond within their chosen teams and gave them the illusion that this was like a game rather than, you know, something that deals with real people's lives. Cheating or alleged cheating is always a way to draw media attention. Last year, we saw couples that mostly flew under the radar, like Try Guys, Ned Fulmer and Ariel, and John Mulaney and Anna Marie Tendler, suddenly get a storm of attention when one member was suspected to have cheated on the other. And a lot of the reason for why we respond to cheating in this way is not just because in this country, a lot of people hate cheating <laughs> and they feel like another couple's cheating drama potentially brings up maybe their own trauma with cheating, but also a lot of the reason that the public responded to John Mulaney and Ned Fulmer was because of their personal image crafting as celebrity figures. Another case where celebrity image crafting goes into the reception of a relationship fallout is Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake. Britney Spears became famous at a pretty young age on Mickey Mouse Club and then became a worldwide pop star by the time she was 18 years old. She also grew up in the Bible Belt and was raised Christian and as a teenager had professed that she was going to wait to have sex until marriage. All of this was emphasized by the fact that everything about her presentation leaned on the innocent and docile. Her Hit Me Baby One More Time video had her dancing around in a schoolgirl outfit and she was pressured to sing with the childlike voice by her management. Evidently, in the dickest move of the century, during a radio interview for Star and Buck Wild Morning Show in 2002, Justin Timberlake broke the news that he and Britney did have sex during their relationship. The Star and Buck Wild Morning Show. Justin Timberlake is in the house. And I just want to ask you one question. Did you <laughs> Britney Spears? <laughs> yes or no? Oh, man. Come on, man. Okay, I did it. No, Justin no. also went on this, like, retaliation crusade, which inevitably raised support for him over Britney. The world has long been full of Madonna wannabes, and I might have even dated a couple. For example, for his Cry Me a River music video that was released in 2002, he showed getting revenge on a woman who has been unfaithful to him, and the woman, of course, looks a lot like Britney Spears. Part of the reason for the anti-Britney fervor was, of course, like, textbook misogyny, but also because of this perceived switch up from her innocent Puritan image. Not only did she sleep with Justin, who she was not married to, she also slept with someone else who was not even in the relationship. 
When Diane Sawyer interviewed Brittany in 2003, she attacked her for cheating. You broke his heart. You did something that caused him so much pain, so much suffering. What did you do? While the public generally has been supportive of Britney post-conservatorship, I still feel like the way that image crafting affects relationships and the coverage of relationships has been a constant issue. John Mulaney, for instance, was known as a wife guy, always talking about how much he loves his wife. I love and respect my wife very much. And the media framed him as this good guy feminist. And because of that image crafting, his fans were really betrayed and upset when he divorced his wife and then almost immediately started a relationship with Olivia Munn. Ultimately, the public loves a good show when it comes to celebrity relationship drama coverage. Though for nine times out of 10, the coverage usually skews more misogynistic. Even though we'd like to think that we've fully grown past 2000s era reporting, I feel like just the misogynistic remarks targeted towards Hailey Bieber, Olivia Wilde, Amber Heard, and Angelina Jolie amidst their own scandals in the past year prove otherwise. On a more positive note, people are equally invested in quote-unquote successful celebrity couples. These couples that share wholesome photos of each other on Instagram and do cute couple quiz videos for GQ and whatnot provide their fans with that happily ever after dopamine rush, such as the case with Zendaya and Tom Holland and Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez. The latter couple who were once engaged but broke it off and then finally married 20 years later in a very rom-com Hollywood type of finale. When it comes to celebrity relationships though, it's not just the real ones that matter, it's the fictional ones too. <laughs> For example, Larry Stillins Stillinson, Larry Stillinson, is that correct? Uh, the fictional pairing of Louis Tomlinson and Harry Styles from One Direction. I'm not going to go too deep into the lore for this one because there's quite a lot. And I was also never a One Directioner, so I can't really pull much from my memories. But in general, Larry was believed to varying degrees by fans. And nowadays... Most of them can at least admit that it was more for fun than for any actual believability. So a brief history of how this came about. Fans noticed Harry Styles and Louis Tomlinson were affectionate with each other and closer friends than with other members of their group, which led the swarms of mostly teenage girls to come to the conclusion that the boys were in a romantic relationship being kept secret by their alleged homophobic management. Although there were other pairings, Larry was by far the most popular and had the most dedicated fan base. But, you know, this is not the first time that fans have shipped band members. Um, one of the earliest ones I can think of is Mick Lennon, which is the ship name of John Lennon and Paul McCartney from the Beatles. Granted, because a lot of people were more openly homophobic in the 60s, their fan base cannot compare to the scale of the fan base of Larry, but it just goes to show that fixating on a band's inner dynamics is not a new concept. And part of the reason why fans do this is because band members usually have a little social life or little publicized social life outside of their group. Especially since the 90s, boy and girl groups have been mostly just cogs in the pop culture manufacturing machine. They would rehearse long, long hours and they weren't allowed to date or really do anything fun that most um, young people do with their lives. In South Korea, uh, the K-pop industry is notorious for this kind of like uh, controlling management style. This all incidentally leads to a lot of intergroup shipping. The rationality behind it is if they don't have time to date or hang out with other people, then who's to say they're not dating each other? <laughs> Taehyung and Jungkook from BTS are one of the more popular ones, and Jenny and Lisa from Blackpink as well. So Thomas Bottonet wrote a really good article on this topic and how idol shipping affects fans of different cultures. He writes, In particular, shipping that reimagines boy groups such as BTS within romantic or homoerotic relationships is especially common as a method of articulating fandom and exploring sexual agency, thus producing spaces within Korea's patriarchal society where women's sexual desires can be safely explored. While BTS shipping in Japan tends to conceptualize homoerotic relationships between men via sexual practices and behaviors divorced from identity, Anglophone shipping tends to instantly overtly deploy LGBTQ identity politics. Nevertheless, both practices possess queer potentials that allow fans to effectively explore their sexuality. Shipping has become such a big part of fandom culture that there's also like rumors that go around that management companies encourage shipping among fans as a marketing tactic. Like they have the idols doing um, skinship and other kinds of like fan service. 
And while we're on the topic in general, there's been a long history of bands and artists, especially those with queer audiences, performing queerness or bisexuality on stage by everyone from pop punk boy bands to the infamous 2003 VMA's Madonna, Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera kiss. But we can't talk about fake ships without talking about Taylor Swift or Gaylor. Gaylor is this fan theory that Taylor is queer. Gaylor fans have come to this conclusion by fixating on queer interpretations of her lyrics, like secret romances and disapproving families, and on her documented female friendships with other celebrities like Diana Agron and Cara Delevingne. But most famously, her friendship with Carly Kloss was shipped as Kaylor. So how did Gaylor come about? Well, Taylor Swift's brand, like what most music artists try to do, encourages parasociality among her fans. But what I think makes Taylor particularly special is the fact that she's been around for over a decade, which allows a lot of fans to grow up alongside her, and also her songwriting style, which leans towards confessional. Part of her songwriting style also includes leaving Easter eggs, aka self-references, or hints at future projects, which lead fans to believe that she does the same with her sexuality and relationships. This ultimately intensifies the parasocial relationships that her very dedicated fans have with her because they feel that they have a secret knowledge of who she is actually that other, more casual, less dedicated fans don't have. For example, when her song Lavender Haze dropped, some fans interpreted the song as a reference to queerness because of Lavender's symbolism in queer history. Another reason why fans might uh, believe that a certain celebrity is queer because of the music industry and Hollywood's history of forcing their talent into the closet. Lance from NSYNC was closeted until 2006 to protect the band's reputation. Theorizing on its own is harmless, and it does have the potential to build close-knit communities. And while I don't believe Gaylor and, you know, Larry fans are maliciously trying to out celebrities in any particular way. Unfortunately, fixating on a person's sexuality, especially in public online spaces, can lead to that. And especially when fans cross boundaries and start harassing celebrities for answers. Louis Tomlinson actually admitted that the Larry relationship allegations hurt his friendship with Harry in real life by making them feel as though every minor interaction they had was being surveyed and overanalyzed. I also remember the actor Kit Connor from Heartstopper was pressured into outing himself because fans were accusing him of queer baiting. Similar to the idea that a celebrity hanging out with their friend or with their band member leads to people theorizing that they're in a relationship, this also applies to romantic co-stars um, for actors. Across so many movies and TV shows, fans believe that great chemistry on screen must translate to great chemistry off screen too. For example, David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson in The X-Files, Oscar Isaac and Jessica Chastain in Scenes from a Marriage, and Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Zoe Deschanel in 500 Days of Summer. It all seems rooted in this belief that uh, everything that's portrayed on a stage or on screen must have some kernel of truth, and all the public-facing PR acting that celebrities do when they're promoting their movies must be genuine. The fact that there are actually lots of examples of real celebrities meeting on set and falling in love, like Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton and Brangelina, as I mentioned before, um, only fan the flames. But, you know, just because celebrities have great chemistry doesn't mean that there's actually anything going on. For example, Sydney Sweeney and Glenn Powell were facing dating speculations during their filming and press interviews for their upcoming romantic comedy, Anyone But You. Even though they never officially dated, their public flirtiness made headlines, made especially scandalous considering they were both dating other people at the time. Sydney is still engaged to restaurateur Jonathan Devino, and she was engaged to him throughout the entirety of this filming, but it's a relationship she has kept mostly low-key. Glenn was dating model Gigi Paris. Adding to the conspiracy of it, though, Glenn and Gigi broke up with Gigi posting an Instagram video with the cryptic caption, know your worth and on to the next, at the height of the speculations. But it's funny because also Ashton Kutcher and Reese Witherspoon, they did a rom-com together. Um, what is it called? Your Place or Mine? <laughs> which got pretty bad reviews. But I also remember when they were doing all these press events for it, people were like, could they look any less attracted to each other? People on my timeline on Twitter were complaining about them not doing the performative PR flirtation act. So it's kind of like, what do people actually want <laughs> out of celebrities who are co-starring in these movies? Do you want the show of like, flirtation or do you not? And then on the flip side of relationships that are fabricated by the public, 
there are relationships that are fabricated by PR. <laughs> the idea of a PR relationship isn't new and it makes total sense why they work because, you know, as we've mentioned, celebrity relationships can get a lot of press coverage, which can not only be used to promote a movie that two people are in or just like elevate their status as celebrities as a whole. But I will say that over the years, people have become more skeptical about whether or not a relationship is real or if it's just PR. Also, I found that the more random a coupling seems to be, the more likely people think it's PR. So for example, Kim Kardashian and Pete Davidson, um, really Pete Davidson with any woman, also Kylie Jenner and Timothy Chalamet's rumored relationship, as I mentioned earlier. Of course, we'll never really know if something is PR, but it's usually easy to tell. Like, are they usually together only for the length of a press cycle? Do they only have photographs together during planned paparazzi walks? Do their friends tell, like, page six anything particular about their relationship? Or is it just the very general, oh, they're just so in love? One of the most talked about romantic co-star couples from the 2000s was Kristen Stewart and Robert Pattinson, who met on the set of Twilight, which premiered in 2008. They began dating in 2009 and publicly announced the relationship in 2011, then broke up in 2013 after all five Twilight Saga movies had been released. What's interesting about this particular relationship is that Twilight's production team was heavily against it from the beginning, though once they actually started dating, they were really hoping that they would stay together, <laughs> fearing that any drama between them would affect their on-screen chemistry for the remainder of the movies that had to be filmed. While the couple did genuinely get together, at the start, um, there were still reporters who alleged that it was a PR relationship. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that Kirsten Stewart's sexuality has been like a longstanding debate topic for no fucking reason at all because it's no one's actual business. And despite the fact that she has said that she's bisexual, a lot of people use the fact that she's dated a lot of women as ammo for why this relationship could not have happened. However, sometimes relationships are less about capitalizing um, and more about self-preservation, though I feel like it's rare now with like the fact that society has been way more tolerant and accepting of um, LGBTQ relationships. But historically, lavender marriages were ways for celebrities, for queer celebrities, to protect themselves from homophobia. A lavender marriage, by definition, is a male-female mixed orientation marriage undertaken as a marriage of convenience to conceal the socially stigmatized sexual orientation of one or both partners. Emily Marth writes for Vice, Lavender marriages, as they were called, began as a response to big studios including moral clauses in their stars' contracts. Gay stars picked wives, often actresses and celebrities themselves, in order to hide their sexualities and keep fans lusting after them on screen. Actor Rock Hudson married his wife Phyllis Gates in 1955, and while their marriage was never a public scandal, Rock's gayness was considered an open secret in Hollywood. As biographer Mark Griffin told NPR, As one person expressed it to me, he was so kind to everyone that he worked with, whether that was the leading lady or the gaffer or the editor, that everyone sort of uh, kept this secret for him. They knew that if he was exposed at that time that that would have just ended his career immediately. So it is sort of a conspiracy of silence, but it's interesting that they're doing this because they really love this person that they're working with and feel protective of him. A year before the couple married, MGM actor Van Johnson was outed by Confidential Magazine. So there are theories that Rock's talent agent, Henry Wilson, was catching wind of similar targeted exposés towards Rock and knew he had to get him married off quickly. So Rock ended up marrying his 30-year-old secretary, who Griffin describes as having a very engaging, fresh-off-the-farm quality, with this air of county fairs and church socials about her. But it was clear that Phyllis didn't know anything about the marriage, because in 1958, after three years of marriage, she confronted Rock about the gay rumors, and she also hired private eye Fred Otosh to tape record their conversation. And then in 2013, The Hollywood Reporter obtained Otosh's secret files and released a transcript of the conversation. According to the tape transcript, Phyllis asks him, how long after we were married did you have your first homosexual affair? And Rock says, oh, I don't know, the next day. I feel bad for both Rock and Phyllis in this situation. Obviously, I do feel bad for Phyllis because she was lied to. But, you know, also I feel bad for Rock because it was something that he had to do to save himself, his image, his career, everything. 
I mean, J. Edgar Hoover even launched an FBI investigation of Rock for homosexual tendencies in 1965. Rock and Phyllis had the most proof as to having a lavender marriage, but people have speculated on Judy Garland and Vincent Minnelli and Katherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy as well. Considering old Hollywood studios documented strict control of its stars, the widespread homophobia of the era, and the taboo of remaining unmarried, it's not hard to believe that these relationships could have been concocted by the studio system. However, most of the information we have was concocted by gossip calmness or it was all like hearsay, so we can't say for sure which relationship out there was fake and which wasn't. Ultimately, I feel like the reason we care so much about celebrity relationships is in part because of how the media covers them. Tabloids especially love using overtly dramatic phrases like Angie and Jen, explosive face-to-face -face showdown, and Selena's secret, pregnant and alone. Media outlets know how to construct celebrity relationship drama, and they manipulate audiences' desire for parasociality and insider secrets about their favorite celebrities, which in turn ends up hurting audiences and hurting celebrities. And usually a lot of this information is based on like lies <laughs> or they're just based on like these like tidbits that have no factual grounding, right? And for non-fans, the news just covers our timelines and our feeds so it's like inescapable even if we didn't necessarily care about these people to begin with. I think that while celebrity ships can be fun, they can be escapist, they can build communities even, ultimately what's important to remember is that we don't know any of these people. We don't know the celebrities, we don't know the people they're dating, and we don't know the nature of their relationships either. I think over time, I've realized that like I cannot project any type of moral idolatry onto a celebrity because usually they'll prove me wrong because I, I mean, I think it's unfair to project that kind of um, pressure onto anyone anyway because we're all human and we're all imperfect and some people way more imperfect than others, uh, particularly if you're wealthy and have no understanding of your own privilege. But um, needless to say, some of the expectations that people have towards their favorite stars are impossible to live up to. But I also think celebrity relationships and the fanfare for them are inevitable. It's about as inevitable as celebrity culture is because they're just so tied together. I just think it's like interesting to talk about. And I also think it's interesting that as like the older I get, obviously like the more detached I get from celebrity culture and how as a kid I was like super, super into it and just the way that I responded to certain celebrity gossip versus the way that I respond to it now is so different. And I'm wondering if anyone else has gone on that same kind of journey. But anyways, thank you all so much for listening to me today. Uh, the extended version of this will be coming out on Wednesday. And um, yeah, for now, I'll talk to you guys later. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Bye.